Uh, this is Dark Journalist. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone, actually. And I'm joined here now, coming in, piping in through the pipeline by Miss Gigi Young. Gigi, how's it going over there? Good. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had all kinds of interesting uh, streaming activity ever since the different uh, formats ended and Google made it all curveball for everyone. So now we've tried a couple. And uh, tonight we're trying a new one, but I see everyone and I think everything is working out just fine with it. Um, so tonight we are doing X series episode number 63. And this one is very uh, sort of carries over from the last episode that we did last week, GG, which was all about Alice uh, through the looking glass, where I think you opened up a lot of questions about the esoteric nature uh, after we had built some foundation in a couple of episodes around it. Now, uh, just so everyone knows, in X episode 15 was the Alice in Wonderland episode that we did that tied in the Orphic Circle to Alice in Wonderland and Lewis Carroll and the whole esoteric wing at Oxford, uh, the Ashmolean wing. Um, and in the last episode, uh, there was a link, there was a link in the chain, but we went into the second book. And in this episode, we're leaving the books behind <laughs> and we're going directly into the esoteric players and the individuals. And um, Gigi, it's interesting because everywhere I turn in uh, this research around the Orphic Circle, Lewis Carroll, uh, St. Germain, all of these different areas, it is going to Jupiter. And uh, well, this is kind of fascinating because Jupiter, New Jupiter being the kind of goal or something that Steiner gave us as the outline of where all this wave of evolution is going to this New Jupiter echoes New Jerusalem in the Bible. Um, why is it Jupiter? Well, Jupiter is the ascending sphere. So it's the sphere of influence that we are moving into. And we move into that sphere or seal when we reach a certain state of harmony through several ascension and descension cycles on earth, we move into a higher sphere, which has different qualities um, that would represent the future or a higher being. Um, we become more balanced from where we are now and we would have more of those qualities and, and the energy would be built from earth but completely different in its in its features interesting uh it's like earth gives us the foundation um and in the uh anthroposophical overview we're getting that there's a block game going on and the block game is the eighth sphere and it's trying to pre prevent us from in steiner's cosmology developing what he calls the warmth of vulcan <laughs> we'll explain what that is which is needed to create uh, this new Jupiter, which is the new earth. It's, it's basically the next evolutionary wave. And instead uh, what's happening is there's been a vast um, project underway by a, a dark astral force, which is creating this scenario of an eighth sphere. Um, so tonight's show is not about the eighth sphere, but it gives us a good outline about an artificial step and why Jupiter becomes so important when you look at the cosmology that's in, there in the mystery schools. Yeah, well, they're all, we're being sort of, our consciousness is sort of being magnetized in all of these different ways from these different spheres of influence and depending on how we place our consciousness, which is basically our mind, so the thoughts that we're thinking, our self-talk, what we think about each other in the world, and the emotions that we're feeling. So the emotions that we cultivate or feel, that actually determines what sphere we're tapping into or what layer of consciousness, whether it be the lower aspect, which is the eighth sphere, which is you know the past, meaning regressive, or it's the future sphere, which means mastering this uh, dimension, mastering where we are now. So we choose that and right where we are now is really pivotal because a lot of people are, we can see choosing either one and it's very clear and it's very conflicted right now because of that. It's like a tension is developing that has been rising 
since, uh, well, if you, if you look at that, the War of the Mystery Schools in the 19th century, going into the two physical world wars, and this kind of deep straight uh, global control ever since. So now here we are in the 21st century, we have equal exposure to the mystery school doctrines over 100 years, 150 years. And, but these guys have consolidated their power on the other side, the geopolitical players, and the name of the game for them is, is power and control. So it's almost like if we look back into this era and see the setup for how this happened, the scientific materialism coming in in the 1840s, the mystery schools coming in to buffer against that, we'll get some clue as to where we are, say, 175 some uh, years later. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it, the you know there are certain people around that can do these long-term predictions, and they know there's these wobbles where you can either make a huge difference or not, and so. We're in one of those time periods now. I could have called this X63, the wobble. <laughs> the wobble. <laughs> We're in the wobble, folks. Um, we've had some fascinating X reveals recently, which are very significant. You came up with an astounding one that we're going to get to um, here as well, which plays in uh, that I wasn't aware of at all. <laughs> and uh, that's the wonderful thing about working with you, Gigi, is I don't know where you come up with this stuff. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm very trained. I'm very trained. It's all. <laughs> um, we definitely, I want to mention that uh, we do not have the lovely Olivia with us tonight, although she helped set up the show. Uh, she's still recovering from her car accident and she's, she's coming along. Um, it was a major a car accident. She was very lucky to um, have come through it so well. And um, she definitely is doing her her <laughs> bit to, <laughs> she's there in the background. Hi Miss everybody. Olivia, say hello. Hi. Uh, and she will be coming back and joining us for the the, um, the chat, probably for Labor Day maybe. Yes. We'll, we'll say that that's a good mm -hmm. one. Um, we'll do a special episode there, but uh, we definitely uh, look forward to having you back, Miss Olivia. And uh, thank you for all your help with tonight. Tonight, I get to actually watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> now you're talking. Um, so, and with that, uh, also, it's great to have you back for round two of this because, you know, I got to a point about middle in the week, Gigi, and I said, I have all these pieces laid out and over and over again, things that we talked about in the last episode kept coming up. Um, and this has happened to me a few times, uh, you know, when we did the CERN tarot card episode, which we're going to do a part two of, I still get, now that was Halloween of last year, I still get messages asking questions about <laughs> what the things in that episode. So this is, this had that uh, feel. And so thank you so much for kind of getting back in here on this. I think it's crucial. We're at like a certain point with this research around Alice in Wonderland, uh, Lewis Carroll, the esoteric and now Saint Germain comes in of the ascended masters and theosophy and the wonderful kind of things that we learned about him. Now there's a quote uh, that you and I were trading back and forth from Helena Blavatsky. And I was thinking if you read that quote, that'll send us off into the stratosphere. All right. So here is the quote about Saint Germain. The famous adventurer, the Count St. Germain, is supposed to have been a Hungarian by birth, but the early part of his life was by himself carefully wrapped in mystery. His person and his title alike stimulated curiosity. His age was unknown and his parentage equally obscure. We catch the first glimpse of him in Paris a century and a quarter ago filling the court and town with his renown. Amazed, Paris saw a man, apparently of middle age, a man who lived in magnificent style, who went to dinner parties where he ate nothing, but talked incessantly with exceeding brilliancy on every imaginable topic. His tone was perhaps over trenchant, the tone of a man who knows perfectly what he is talking about. Learned, speaking every civilized language admirably, a great musician, an excellent chemist. 
he played the part of a prodigy and he played it to perfection. Wow. And this is so amazing, Blavatsky giving us that hint of who this is and who this was. Um, and really giving us a glowing portrait of this individual. It's obviously someone she admired uh, a great deal. And in her training and in her initiations, St. Germain comes up quite a bit, but we're gonna find St. Germain among the works of Rudolf Steiner. We're gonna find him listed um, when Edgar Casey is doing his overview of the mystery schools in those readings St. Germain comes in, so we know that the mystery schools understand this presence of who this person is. Um, now, he's an actual physical character, so in this, he shares, uh, you know, he's a, an actual historical personage. Um, and Voltaire has written about him. Uh, he was, you know, a contemporary of Casanova. And Casanova writes about him. And it's basically like, you know, I, I can't believe I can't get anything done when this guy's around. <laughs> uh, so we have a historical personage. And then um, we have him confused with a few figures in history, like Count Cagliostro, um, who also is a similar person who seems to emerge 100 years later and not to have age, Gigi. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the footsteps of all these people thinking that Germain, St. Germain was Francis Bacon, who gave us New Atlantis and the Shakespearean plays under the guise of his front man, William Shakespeare. Um, so we have quite a mystery with a lineage where St. Germain moves in and out. Um, and then you have people on the side of like anthroposophy, theosophy, Casey, all talking about St. Germain um, is this then an ascended master who's coming to live among us to kind of set the situation up? Well, if you think about what was said about him, you would, yeah, you would, that's exactly what someone would say about an ascended master. He was, spoke languages perfectly. He knew everything about opposing fields like, you know, chemistry or literature or whatever it was and you know that's exactly mm. what someone would say and there's even around his death there's even controversy around how he died um yes. you know being kind of like nobody went to his funeral and it's kind of like you know you could easily and i guess back then it was much more easier to you know fake a death but it's done in a way his stories are done in a way where it gives you just enough of a nod to let you know, but if you want to doubt, you can doubt. That's how it's done. Absolutely. That's a really good point, actually. It's interesting. There is that legend like with Elvis and with Jim Morrison, you know, that they died, but they didn't really die. And that's all an echo of these stories of St. Germain reappearing. Um, I think it's an interesting point, too, because the object of these mystery schools and the Ascended Masters is not to overwhelm. This is one thing that um, Gurdjieff made very clear, that the mystery schools don't use violence and violent overthrow as a method. They can't. They're literally um, in a different state. <laughs> so a lot of people would think, hey, we'll get these mystery school people together. We'll throw out these guys, you know. And oddly enough, uh, a lot of St. Germain literature was coming into vogue around the time of the French Revolution. And we see a lot of threads of people trying to pick up this esoteric thread of St. Germain and use it for the French Revolution. Years later, um, you'd have all of these forces in pre-World War or War I Germany, and they were taking on the secret doctrine, and they were twisting it to their own ways and means, and using Blavatsky's work to justify their own theories. So we see when the mystery schools do take a risk, some, many times people say to me, why don't the mystery schools just come out and give us all the information after all? They have a risk factor that when they release these things, there'll be a follow-on of people abusing the information that they put out. And so, in fact, they have to be very careful about it. Yeah, they do. And there, there's also um, something where 
that needs to be considered where as soon as a ritual or information makes it into the collective consciousness, then it's available for everyone. Right. So there's a lot that will never even necessarily be spoken or done until it's time. So well, yes, because once someone has even um, integrated it into their mind, technically, a, you know, someone a darker school could pull it out and use it, even if they don't talk to you. So there's a lot about, um, you know, having it, it, it's a lot about information that even people haven't heard of, but coming through at the right time. Um, from higher dimensional places. Oh, it's timing. It is. Um, you just reminded me of something actually that Steiner talks about, which is the esoteric versus the exoteric. And that there's information and knowledge that's contained in this esoteric place. And when it's released and let out into the exoteric public circle, it starts to instantly act mechanically. So, for example, um, in mystical Christianity, all these things were released, you know, all these different ideas um, about ascension and resurrection and all these things. But the mechanical version of that is like the papacy and, you know, this incredible domination um, and that, you know, right makes might because we have Christ on our side. So this is this is an interesting twist. And this is the problem, which is you have that internal esoteric wisdom. And when it's meted out, to the public suddenly because of the the powers and the control and the level that the, the society is on, all that information starts to act mechanically and they just start to use it in the same way that they've been using all the other things. Yeah, and 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 you know what, at that point, when it gets to that mechanical dogmatic level, it it, it chews up the information and, and it associates it with all this stuff that it shouldn't be associated with. So if you have someone who's new, and is looking to get into their spirit, they can't use it anymore. So it's, mm. it, 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 it almost makes it toxic mm -hmm. because it's been, it, it, it's actually not even spirit, it's not esoteric anymore, it's not spiritual. It's, it's become so dogmatic, it's actually toxic for the human soul. And that's why um, information is brought through in certain ways is there's so many different things to consider that people wouldn't even think about so mm, yeah that's a great point actually you know when i think about it um well the flip side of the coin in this episode is zadkiel or zadikiel and um this is an archangel in uh, Hebrew lore, and he shows up in the Bible as the angel that stops Abraham from sacrificing his son by grabbing the dagger, and Abraham's doing this to please God, and he's like, no, no more sacrifice, um, and so he's often pictured with this dagger, um, but in that the real deep Jewish mysticism, he is portrayed as the archangel of Jupiter. Again, we have Jupiter showing up and he's associated with this color purple as is uh, Saint Germain. So there's a lot of overlap in that if you look at it, you can see that very often people think that Saint Germain is Zadkiel. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, you know, I mean, it seems to me that you hit on something uh, when we were talking about this, which is that they are kind of maybe commissioners in a sense of along the same line. Yeah, sort of commissioners of the same ray or commanders of the same ray of consciousness. And it's kind of like they share the same oversoul or the same, they can tap into the same stream of consciousness or they are initiated into the same stream of consciousness. However you wanna, you know, look at it. And it makes sense that, you know, they would maybe even have different names over different times, um, depending on what was in vogue. You know, maybe maybe in the 1800s and 1700s, it's not cool to walk around with that name. I don't know. Maybe it's <laughs> <laughs> so. true. It could have grown and uh, its meaning. I think what's interesting too is 
Zadkiel, we could certainly do an entire show on Zadkiel and St. Germain and the lore around them and the impact that they had. As, as I pointed out, all of the esoteric mystery schools point to them as real uh, in the terms of St. Germain. Zadkiel, I found, is something very, very unusual in this sense, which is the name itself is apparently a key. And um, so when we get into this period of the War of the Mystery Schools around 1840, when half of the mystery schools, uh, according to Steiner and spiritual science, are saying, no way, uh, we can't let these secrets out. And there's a smaller group inside those schools that are saying, we have to get that information out to the public because scientific materialism is taking hold. And within a century, we won't recognize these people and their consciousness is gonna get more narrow and more narrow. So this is the time to let these things out. And all sorts of strange uh, things come out as a result of this. The Fox sisters uh, come out and they suddenly can communicate with the dead. And it's quite a craze. Um, and in the middle of all that is Emma Britton. So we have this kind of um, buildup that happens. But what happens in the middle of all that is this Zadkiel person <laughs> uh, shows up authoring Emma Britton's books. Now, anyone who's familiar with the show is familiar with Emma Britton. Um, and she is somebody who the more, you know, all the, the more research that I do, it seems like over and over again, it comes back to Emma Britton, who is a founder of the Theosophical Society, uh, along with Helena Blavatsky, let's not forget. And interestingly enough, in Boston in 1872, founds the Western Star, which is basically the Western foundation for theosophy. So um, this term Zadkiel, which she gives to the person who's giving her this information to do these two breakthrough books, um, one of them being Ghostland, uh, all about these mystery school esoteric rituals, and the other one being art magic, and Ghostland mentions the Orphic Circle. Um, the term itself, GG, Zadkiel, Zadikiel, there's, there's some kind of messaging going on there. Well, it obviously sounds like an archangel name with the L at the end because L means God. So that's yeah. what I would it, And the moment that you hear it, you're like, this is obviously the name of an archangel, just figuring out which one it is. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And then yeah. Zad, I'm not sure what Zad or what, what it would be, but. Yeah, well, it's interesting to break the name down that way. Um, how do you feel about its appropriation by these people who are bringing it out, like William Lilly um, or this person? There's a, a person in the 19th century named Richard Morrison who we're going to talk about tonight, too. I wanted to point this picture out, um, which is Blavatsky with the Ascended Masters here. This is quite interesting, actually. We'll take a quick look at this. Um, so Blavatsky is pictured there with um, El Moria and the other ascended masters, uh, Kutumi. And over here we see that is Saint Germain. And um, Saint Germain is pictured with her there and they are sort of seen as guiding her work. Um, Along the same lines, we have this person, Zadkiel, giving us uh, Emma Britton. He's, he's basically laying out the Orphic Circle and the foundation. Now, it's funny because it turns out that, of course, she's already been in the Orphic Circle for so many years when she was uh, between 9 and 14. So um, a lot of people have pointed out that when Zadkiel comes forward, who we know is an astrologer actually named Richard Morrison, who was part in the UK of the Orphic Circle. Um, he's using the name and actually the Zadkiel Almanac for astrology is so popular that his, his name is fairly well known in the 19th century. Um, but it comes out that people start saying, wait a minute, all of these things, the way it's written and all the rest, it's actually Emma Britton bringing through her experience allegorically using this Zadkiel. So again, we have it as a kind of a, a plug-in. So she's channeling the 
energy of Zadkiel, then that's what that would be. Um, yes. Which makes sense because if he's the presence, if he represents the the consciousness of Jupiter, and then that would be basically a stream to Jupiter. That's what that would be. And that's exactly what humanity would need if that's where you're going. So it's basically the correct ascension teachings for the time. In order to get those, you would have to tune into an entity that was representing the place where you're going. So. That's really interesting. I think it's fascinating that Richard Morrison, um, who did a lot of major things, actually. Um, he actually started some major astronomical works. Um, he He's known for having done some impressive things with telescopes, aside from all of his incredible um, work with astrology. Now, um, he does an interesting twist, Gigi, is he calls himself Zad Kiel, and then Tau C, T S E, uh, and I'm getting just a little a flip back, so I'm going to lower myself on my board. I'm just going to have you lower yours just a tiny bit. Uh, everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. We're here with uh, Gigi Young. It's X Series episode 63. This is the XE reveal. We did introduce XE, um, who is Alexandra Kitchen, uh, who was a favorite model for Lewis Carroll when he was developing the second book. Uh, of Alice Through the Looking Glass, and um, there are some amazing things we're going to reveal about her tonight. But somehow Zadkiel and the St. Germain Mystery School tie-in is here right in the middle of it. And uh, we've just arrived at this kind of pivotal point where Zadkiel, who again has written these books, and is the name that uh, Emma Britton gives to her source, basically, for Ghostland and Art Magic. Now, He's also a well-known astrologer, and uh, that goes all the way up to Queen Victoria, who we're going to find is associated with Exe uh, through Alexandra, who is going, who is the um, queen consort of Edward. So it gets very, very interesting there. But you, you knew, you suspected there was a royal tie-in to the Orphic Circle, and now we're finally arriving at it. Um, Tautzi. GG, uh, we did some interesting research on this and came up with some interesting things, but something that you found uh, really blew me away. <laughs> and, and if you say it, I'll find it here so I can show it. <laughs> well, when you sent me the, um, the name of the tribe that had gone from Persia, yes, they were called um, uh, Tautzi. Yeah. And um, I, I looked up, I'd heard the, 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 the name Seek before like S-T-S-E. And I was like, what does that mean again? And so I Googled it and um, it actually meant X-I-E, which is basically X-E. It's not pronounced X-E, you know, it's pronounced a different way that I do not speak Cantonese, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's expelled the exact same way. So it was just a strange synchronicity that same spelling, XIE, of course, XE is called XE. Um, and we'll remind everyone uh, that this is XE Kitchen. Uh, quite remarkable. She was the child model, and she also grew up into this role. And this one in particular I find fascinating. It's called Sleepless by Lewis Carroll. It's an unusual uh, name there when you think of all the somnambulism that we were talking about that they were using in the Orphic Circle. And I think that this is really a strong point that, that we need to keep in mind um, because one of the key things that goes on is when we deal with someone like Lewis Carroll, he's brilliant with riddles, he's brilliant with mathematics. After all, he was a mathematician, not a novelist in the beginning. And that's what he was known for. So when he has uh, these pictures of Exe and they're called sleepless. Uh, I think he's giving us the hint that this is what she's like when she's not in that somnambulist trance. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things here about Exe. Um, she was um, his favorite subject. 
And um, he did a number of things with her, and you know, he he won all these awards for photographs with Exy. Now, Exy, as we revealed in the last episode, um, she is the daughter of George Kitchen and um, Maude Adams Kitchen. And basically, the interesting thing about her background that makes no sense is that her godmother is Queen Alexandra, and who was the Princess of Wales longer than any uh, woman ever held that title, and at one point was called the most powerful woman in the world. Um, and somehow, you know, Exy, who is the daughter of basically a schoolmaster who become, you know, who works at Christ Church at Oxford, um, and then eventually he becomes a, a dean of another school, but certainly nothing that would attract royal attention. How on earth is Exy under the kind of protective umbrella of the Queen of England? It is very curious. It's very curious. Um, obviously, her and her family had some kind of value. Yeah. Um, they were providing something. Um, but I mean, I think that sometimes when we think of like the royal family, um, we think that's as high as it goes, or if that's the that's like the pinnacle. But there's lots of other um, circles and people and groups that have like a, they almost represent something different, but they're parallel in a way to monarchy, but they're not taking that public position um, um, for whatever reason. They may not want to be public. They may not want to take that on. I mean, if you think about, if, you, if you're royalty, you're, you're, you, you have a lot of danger, um, you're really out there and not every family is gonna wanna put themselves out there like that. True, true. There might be these strata of places where the royal family can actually go for information, can go to get out of the limelight as well. Interesting that he's at Oxford and his friend, George Kitchen's friend, of course, is Lewis Carroll, whose real name is Charles Dodgson. Um, Dodgson, who really has a very emo <laughs> kind of way about him. He really um, does. <laughs> quite remarkable. Uh, when you get around his work, what kind of impressions do you get of Charles Dodson, who uh, became such a famous author? I feel like he's so emo and pensive and like staring into his notebooks because he's so before his time. Yeah. And he, and he knows it. And he's, he's, he's a hybrid or he's, you know, tapping into higher consciousness and he's channeling things. And I think that there's a loneliness, there's there, there's a magicalness, but then there's also kind of like a loneliness because it's almost like he doesn't have any peers that really get him or understand him. So uh, kind of like the, the typical, you know, genius. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point actually. He's, um, he finds himself in a dream world and, um, but oddly enough, he's kind of, along with all of his other work, uh, you know, he's going to become a, a, a priest. <laughs> and then at the end, he's like, you know what? I don't want the priest part, but can I actually just keep on here at Oxford? Is that okay? And they're like, it seems like a waste of time, but okay. <laughs> uh, and then he starts to become this caretaker of what? The Ashmolean wing, which is this incredible uh, library that Ashmole has been developing since the 17th century. Uh, and this very fascinating character who is not only a Rosicrucian, but he's a Mason. And so Carol day after day is surrounded by Masonic and Rosicrucian information. And then we get Alice in Wonderland, then we get Exy, and we get George Kitchen working with him in Oxford, and we get Exy whose godmother is Queen Alexandra. <laughs> That's, <laughs> it's a very interesting ring. It's people right. would never know that though. People wouldn't associate all of these different things, but they yeah. make sense. After the fact, looking back 150 years, they probably were thinking after we're dead, who cares if they find out? 
<laughs> um, let's take a quick, before we get into Tout C, don't worry, I'm going to, uh, everyone <laughs> in the audience is like, hey, Tout C, you built that whole thing up. Just wait, it's coming and it's gonna be uh, quite remarkable. But I wanna show everyone um, this uh, Queen Alexandra who, um, we're really going to get into a little bit here, but she was the Princess of Wales for 38 years, and she, um, you know, it's her daughter, uh, her her goddaughter is Exy, and she has children of her own, and she becomes more and more powerful, and when Queen Victoria dies, of course, uh, Edward VII takes over, and she is his queen consort. So an incredibly powerful woman, um, and now we have this incredibly huge power center plugged into Exe, Carol, and Kitchen. So it gives us some idea. I think we start to figure out where we are in terms of who these people are. Um, Zach Keel, as I've found, uh, Richard Morrison, he is with his astrological almanacs and his predictions, starting very much like William Lilly a century before him, he's starting to get the attention of the royalty. And Queen Victoria mentions him. And she mentions something about his very unusual seeing into crystals. So she, Queen Victoria, um, who's also quite a remarkable character, and she will be the mother-in-law to uh, Queen Alexandra, she is open to these kind of psychic strains. And what's interesting to me is she is the one who makes Edward marry Alexandra. Oh. It's under her, she's the one who's like, that's a good choice. Even though uh, her family, Alexandra's family is from Denmark and it's not great strategically and there are all sorts of hassles with it. And the, the more we go into Alexandra, who again is Exe's godmother, um, she, it turns out, her nephew becomes Nicholas, the Tsar of Russia. So incredible high-end royalty strains coming off of this, uh, the deeper we go. That's incredible. But they're selected, it seems like they're kind of selectively breeding. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> trying to like capture some qualities. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but here, Morrison as Zadkiel dealing with Queen Victoria. I mean, we're starting to see that that Zadkiel terminology again, it's, it's uh, turning keys. It's moving now. Emma Britton uses the name. He's using the name. Um, when we go back further, we'll find William Lilly associated with this name. Um, so we're getting into the name aspects. You know, you've done some wonderful work in your series, and I, I want to recommend everyone watch the In Plain Sight episode that you did on blood and the significance of blood and the occult significance. And um, it's it was a bold episode, and I think that you handled it just well, because there's always so much going over the top around this. Uh, so to get something sensible on that was great. But one of the things now that we've touched on the blood aspect is the names. And in Zadkiel's case, Tautzi. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> yes. So the Tautzi, is that, is that another name for Zadkiel? It's, it's a hyphen. It's like Zadkiel Tautzi. Oh, and oh, okay. So that is it. Is it like a title? Well, very interestingly, he was going to. He was in the process of developing his own kind of version of a mystery school, and oh. yeah, uh, and so he was using what was one of the original mystery schools from this period of about the eleventh, twelfth century. Now, oddly enough, I had to go to Marco Polo's work to find the real root origins for Tao Tse. Ah, oh, okay. Um, and it's funny because there's a whole thing about Marco Polo and all his travels to China, and they took decades and all the rest of it. Um, and you would think, you know, there, there are all these monasteries and things in China, and of course, deep secrets there. But would you think 
that when you get to China, that you see a group practicing the Kabbalah, which seems a little bit odd. It does seem odd, but then there's that whole Gobi situation. Yes. yes. So, you know, the Gobi Desert, nobody really knows what that strange structure is there. There's very strange mummies that yes. predate um, a lot of the civilizations there now. We don't really understand. Nobody wants to talk about it. So China's a big esoteric mystery. Um, there may be this. Yeah. You're tying these in really well because um, in, in Casey's work, we have the lost city of the Gobi. You and I did an episode on that in June. And Gurdjieff, of course, went to the Gobi and they used those incredible metaphors of him on those stilts with the storm going on underneath them while they walked past the storm and all the unusual things. And I think that you really had some great insight there that doesn't exist um, when looking at Gurdjieff's activity around the Gobi. He is saying there is a lost city in the Gobi, just like Casey was saying it. Um, that city often called the city of gold. And um, one of the things that Casey said about it was that the prince of that land was named Mu Zuan, and Mu had blue skin and six fingers. Um, There's not a good explanation. For, he doesn't say anything about why. <laughs> but we know that Krishna had blue skin, GG. Well, the blue, the blue skin follows me. Um, follows me around. Um, I think that we're looking at a different race of, of, of beings from another time or another, you know, um, a kind of a higher density um, beings that are here. Um, I think that's what that is. And, and we do have a very blended population that is different densities of human being living here. And they do look differently. If you have six fingers, it means you're rooted in the sixth dimension, or you have access clearly to that dimension. You can, everybody has that tree that goes up to the Godhead. Everybody has that, but not everybody is initiated into working with certain energies. They're there for you, but you have to work up to it. So if somebody has, you know, six fingers, that means that they're initiated into that higher dimension. We have five, which means that when we have working psychics here, you know, we can go into the highest psychic like can really start anchoring into that higher fifth level. So that's speaking about their spiritual access, their spiritual configuration. Um, and um, these, the hybrid topic is something that we really need to talk about because there's a lot of confusion around it. And there's a lot of people that want to get their hands on it and mm -hmm. control it. Because if people can understand our past origins and how people have sort of been for less, I, I don't have a better word, but hybridized, um, it's just a very sensitive narrative that would be really empowering for people to know the truth about. Oh, no question. Or well, that is the whole reclaiming your consciousness thing that you talk about. Um, right. And, you know, it's interesting because um, the main whistleblower in the Zadkiel story is this uh, Louis Chevalier in the Emma Britton books. And where does he reside, Gigi? He's in Havana. <laughs> is Havana like a Jupiter portal? <laughs> <laughs> He's in the hot zone, he's a city. Uh, but it is interesting the amount of times uh, Boston, <laughs> Havana, and Bimini uh, these areas come up over and over again when we research these things. Pennsylvania does as well. And we had an interesting synchronicity with your family background and the Corsons that we'll talk about too, because that's very interesting. <laughs> and also right on the bullseye with this. Uh, everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. We're here with uh, Gigi Young, who is uh, guiding us through different aspects of the mystery school psychic uh, developments and some of the psychic exercises that they were doing. And I always say when we get around the mystery school edge and we're dealing with the X steganography, which is the foundation of the show of how they, these schools and these secret societies use this X, um, if you don't go in eyes open on the psychic side and Gigi, you know, when you're really tuning into these things, it is, you're, it's like going in with half a blind drawn. 
you know, it's like driving with one eye shut because you're missing all these other things that go on. And I love the researchers um, who, who get around this material, but very often they'll say, well, you know, I can talk about the history of it. I can talk about the people and the implications, but they take no position on if any of the psychic stuff happened. And it's kind of a problem. They really, honestly, I've seen some really interesting articles and then they'll kind of be like, well, this person channeled this about it. You can kind of like listen to it if you want, but it's kind of garbage. So, and that's so, and I think that's just so sad for the time that that's how we treat our spirit. That's how we treat our creativity. That's how we treat our soul is we're like, that's kind of garbage. You can kind of listen to it if you want, but like, I don't know, you know? And um, I think that we're, the, the reality is with psychic information, yes, there are bad psychics, but we're not gonna get new information or accurate information for the time unless we have good psychics because as great as the information is in the 1800s or 1700s or what have you, we have information that can be channeled now for this time from Jupiter, from higher beings. And we need that now, you know? So um, we really have to respect our spirit and, um, and take in all different types of information, whether it be logical or psychic, and it's up to the individual to discern. And that's why people don't like it is because they're lazy and they don't want to discern the information because discerning information means that you have to go within and that you have to have discipline and that you have to know yourself. Because if you don't know yourself, then you don't know how to discern. And that's the real reason why people don't want to take in information is because they're overwhelmed that they don't know themselves. Oh, it's fascinating. Well, that means really that they want an expert to tell them this is how it's done, just like you'd get, here's a political expert telling you what's going on geopolitically in the world. You really don't have to think about it that much afterwards. Just neural link it. Yeah. <laughs> neural link it. Don't have to think anymore at all. Just get a brain download straight up. Yeah. Just say, even... <laughs> why use it? <laughs> Not even the good kind. No. <laughs> um. So this is fantastic. I want to remind everyone, uh, you can go to darkjournalist.com, sign up for our newsletter, uh, stay in touch with us. We've seen the incredible shutdown going on in social media. Uh, Gigi, this is astounding uh, what's been going on. They, they've literally been shutting off channel after channel or just demonetizing them. Uh, you mentioned that they actually demonetized a, a video that you had. Yeah, they do um, demonetize videos that I have. Um, just because you use certain words, like I had videos titled like intuition development or like opening your heart, like pretty normal new agey stuff. <laughs> and they're like, this is inappropriate or for our advertisers or advertisers don't like this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy town. Yeah. You know? Um, and it's, it's, I, I can understand political videos being, you know, because don't, don't, you know, educate people on the deep state and what's really going on. But when they start targeting like natural health. Yes. And maybe like a spiritual YouTuber, that should be a deeper cut. Because that's a whole deeper level of control than just political. That's actually consciousness and your health and things like that. Um, but yeah, they do try to um, do weird things like kind of with your algorithms and, and things like that. It's not a good scene for independent creators right now. No, it's changed drastically in just say a year and a half, really. I, it was I, always teetering, we, you know, but. <laughs> no question. Yeah. Definitely. You know, it's amazing. Uh, and of course, anyone who's watching can get around that. If you go to ggyoung.com, you'll be able to have access to Gigi's courses. Um, you can also find her on YouTube. Her videos are there, uh, and you have to kind of, you know, basically it is, it's a wing of prayer. Like she was saying, uh, you know, that's the way that it looks to me also, which is you don't know where it's coming from. So make sure you're signed up uh, for the newsletter, uh, get on Gigi Young's uh, mailing list and get that information flowing. So you have that pipeline, uh, with us also that way. And what happens with us, basically you get a newsletter once a week on Friday that lets you know the show that's coming up, like tonight's show, and uh, what the guest is and what the topic is. And that's pretty much it. Like, I mean, it's it's that simple, but it is definitely the time to have the real, the kind of deeper links, the deeper connections. So make sure that you have that on your radar. Um, Gigi, we talked about 
Tautzi. And now I'm going to read a couple of quick things from Marco Polo about this. And we're going to start to understand, oh, there's something about this Exe name, there's something about this group, which doesn't quite fit in back there in China. And that's why he's writing about it. Um, now, this is interesting because I had no idea that Marco Polo was going to show up. <laughs> Marco Polo, the incredible uh, 13th century navigator and explorer, and uh, he did some incredible, incredible journeys. And I think some of the, the things that have come out of all that work, you know, all the different cultural observations, he was in a unique position in many ways um, to get his hands on something before it was so heavily filtered by academia. And um, so he could look at these other cultures and he's coming in and yeah, you know, he, he can talk about these other cultures and say like, oh, they're not Christian, make these observations. But he's giving us a real bird's eye view because he's there. And here's what he had to say about the Tao Tse. The Tao Tse, says Marco Polo, were looked upon as heretics by the other sects. By the way, it was determined that this group had come in to China from Persia, which is now Iran. And uh, we know that when we get into the history of Persia, uh, we're getting into uh, some very fat, like Ahura Mazda and Araman, and all those battles take place there in the Zoroastrian uh, end of it. But anyway, he says they were looked upon as heretics by the other sects. That is, of course, by the Lamas and Ho Shangs. In fact, um, in his time, this book, I, I do recommend The Travels of Marco Polo. Um, and it, it definitely, uh, but, you know, there's many different aspects of it, but I, what I like is that he really gets into the meat of the action. So um, what he says is that, in fact, in his time, a passionate struggle was going on between the Buddhists and the Tao Tse. And remember Zadkiel using Tao Tse. Or rather a persecution of the latter by the former, that is the Buddhists persecuting the Tao Tse. This is very interesting The Buddhists would be persecuting anyone. Um, the Buddhists attributed to the doctrine of the Tao Tse a pernicious tendency and accused them of deceit. And in support of their assertions, they pointed to some of their sacred books, taking advantage of their influence at court. They persuaded Kubla, I'm thinking this is Kubla Khan, but we can verify that, to decree the burning of these books. And it was carried out in Peking, according to Marco Polo. So they burned the Tao Tse's book. This is the first sign, the first indication that something's not quite right here. Um, also interesting that they had books because, you know, in the 1200s and 1300s, only a few people did. Mm -hmm. The term which Polo writes as Sensen appears to have been popularly applied to the Tautzi sect in the Mongol court. This is another thing I want to point out. When he gets there, he's like, you have to keep something in mind. There's two different Tautzi. There's the regular kind of ones who fit in with the Chinese and the Buddhists, and there is a totally different sect, uh, and they are the ones who study Kabbalah and all the rest of it, which is quite fascinating. Um, <laughs> I'm so getting... it like evolved somehow, like when they were there. Yes, exactly. And obviously with a totally different uh, side. And uh, <laughs> someone, there's someone actually literally at the door of the uh, studio here. Olivia. <laughs> Miss Olivia. <laughs> I think it's Olivia. Okay. I didn't uh, hear anything. <laughs> it's a brief interruption, everyone. <laughs> Um, but uh, we definitely, just in case it's someone trying to get in, I'm going to throw the comm over to you and I'm going to go just open it real quick. I'll be right back. <laughs> and hang tight. Yes, yes. Come in, come in. Yes, indeed. Okay. <laughs> We're live. How are you? There you go. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're talking. Thank you, Miss Olivia. Everyone, Miss Olivia, a round of applause. <laughs> Way to go. Can I start a question? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, early on, Grandma Tippy Toes uh, was asking whether 
um, St. Germain could have been Pleiadian, and was there a Pleiadian connection to any of the ascended masters? JJ. Yeah, I, th I actually think there is. Pleiade, the, the Pleiades is a big topic, but it has to do with our genesis and our, our, our beginnings, and in some ways where we'll also end up because beginnings are sometimes also endings. Mm. Um, mm, kind of like evolved endings. Um, and uh, yeah, I do think so. I think so. Um, but I think that that's why you see people wonder why, why do the, all the ascended masters kind of like look the same or why do some groups look the same? And I think it could be speaking about their origin. Ah. Uh. Well, you know, that's really interesting, too. Let's take a, a little sidebar on the Pleiadians for a moment, because <laughs> when you get into all that, which you've done some very interesting videos on the Pleiadians, I want to add, um, and the Pleiadians very often are portrayed in this Nordic fashion. You know, they're usually uh, kind of Aryan, and they are uh, blonde very often. They're portrayed that way, and they show up almost angelic at times. Um, it seems to me that of the, all the alien types that we've heard about or that we know about, the Pleiadians are the ones who look the most human and they, they're this kind of exaggerated, perfect human. Yes, they are. They're sort of like, they, are, they actually are the most human. Now that I think about it, um, they are. We also see kind of like devolved humans, which tend to be more the greys, you know, hu human kind of-ish but devolved and then evolved, seeing both kind of the spectrum of the grays there. Um, oh, true, they are with no hair and everything else. They seem like- They kind of devolved. Strength. Yeah. And then, and then now they're on an evolutionary, you know, path. And they've also had a lot of great progress, but they also have a really, really dark side. So the grays are really confusing, although they're humanoid. Their journey's kind of really, confusing and tough. Uh -huh. um, but the Pleiadians definitely are the most um, human looking for, yeah, definitely. I'd never really thought about that, but they, but they are. No question about it. Uh, they, and they seem to be the best candidates for the kind of biblical interactions. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of these are literal angelic beings, but if there were any aliens that were visiting that looked, you know, like the Ezekiel, uh, story is quite unusual when he meets, uh, you know, he kind of sees these ships. He's obviously witnessing a technology and that goes beyond just an angelic thing. Enoch gets on ships. Um, and what's really interesting, actually, uh, just as an aside, thinking about Ezekiel is that they asked Casey in a reading, you know, what are these ships that Ezekiel is describing? And uh, Casey's answer is even weirder. He says, Oh, they're the same thing that, uh, you know, the, the Atlanteans had, uh, but it's a much later date. So it's like, well, who was running that stuff that late then? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's like, there's this sense. And I think this is, this gets into like Enki and Enlil and all of these, the Nephilim, these creation stories. We're getting into that. And um our language has changed. And I think we're just calling that Pleiadian. You know, you can also look at it as, I mean, that's how planets evolve. I mean, if we just want to get into the nitty gritty of how planetary systems evolve, um, there are beings that are just a little bit ahead of a certain density, maybe 3D, whatever. And they will, they've achieved something and they will come down and solidify their achievements by teaching and helping another planet. However, they are subject to all of the challenges and descension cycles and ascension cycles that everyone they're teaching is to. So it's not like they're immune. Maybe some factions are, but some may, like maybe some people escape or have a different journey. But well, that's why it's so complicated is because we call them angels or, or, or whatever, but from a more practical standpoint, they're higher density beings that are that were subject to the same kind of challenges, and some have made it, and some have not. And there's a bunch of drama around it, and um, there's a battle for that narrative to control what that drama was. 
It's so interesting. Uh, and to see that, you know, in the way that the UFO reporting has gone, to, um, really is this controlled thing, this kind of, you know, CIA militaristic version of, of UFO activity um, and research. And you think about just like the 90s or the early 2000s, and you had a much more, or even the 60s, you had this whole kind of consciousness raising idea about <laughs> Space Brothers and, and things like that. And it's moved into this super militaristic, like, you know, Louis Elizondo, CIA man, uh, you know, and the whole narrative that the TTSA has put out, um, which is crumbling, you know, every week a new story comes out. Uh, the SEC just warned about these guys and they had a hearing in Congress that the way they've structured their corporation is some really dicey stuff. And they, you know, so this is the kind of interesting thing these guys are running into. Um, that seeding into the public consciousness of this threat idea associated with aliens, really, it gets us down to the same kind of aspects that we're talking about here, because again, a lot of the religions that were popular at the time when the mystery school was coming in, the religions were pointing at them and saying, heretic, you know, burn these guys, like they burn the books of the Tao Tse. Absolutely. And one way to look at it is that negative groups that are, didn't do very well, they fell really, really hard, they're selfish, they're greedy, they need to lord over people. They need to. They need to trick you. They need to make you think that you're connecting with your spirit is a threat. Connecting with your higher self is a threat. They need you to think that. Why? Because they want your consciousness. <laughs> because consciousness is the biggest commodity there is. It's not water. It's not gold. It's consciousness. And um, right. And so yeah. they want to create threat narratives. And and when we fear the cosmos psychologically and subconsciously, that's the fear of our own soul and the fear of ourself. Um, and so it's to entrap people just to speak plainly. It, it's to make people fear. And I think people need to think about that um, really, really closely. And is that what they want to think? And now obviously, Tom DeLong is tweeting about hybrids now. Yes. He's talking about uh -huh. Atlantis and things like that. And so we can see that they're wanting to curate the human origin narrative. We can see that. We can see yeah. that's that wanting. Is. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and if they do that, it, it, it's, it, it makes it harder to sense. You, you want to remember yourself through your own heart. And that's what the good groups will do. The beings that are here, that are genuinely teachers, that are genuinely ascended or that are genuinely on the light side, they're not gonna lord over you. They're not gonna force anything on you. They'll leave it there for you. And that's the difference between these two factions is they're not gonna tell you what it is. This is a threat, this is that. They're going to leave things for you so that you can remember who you are because the biggest achievement that we can have is to remember how to think in a certain way, a psychic way. How to, how to process information the way we used to before we fell, which more. is a hyper-psychic, hyper-functional way of taking in more information than we're used to. The, the higher beings want us to remember how to do that. And that doesn't come from telling people anything. It, it, it helps, it, it, it comes from leaving pieces. And so by your own initiative, you remember who you are. And that's the big difference between the two. Wow, um, absolutely. Um, it's this very, very uninformed, uh, you know, group dynamic. When uh, I'll just mention this about the TTSA, like it's all driven. You've got Chris Mellon who represents the money interests. You've got Elizondo representing the CIA, um, and Jim Semi Van, who's a 25 year CIA veteran. They're all CIA guys, so they're representing that strata, and it's just the opposite strata that you need to understand a phenomenon like that. When you get around the UFO file you are looking at a completely different dynamic, uh, something, you know, it, it's not something that you can take a nuke and solve the problem with. Um, but I think that they are turning it into this kind of lower consciousness thing of let's have a ground war with the things that are flying in our skies. And it is really a controlled narrative. Um, now, I think the TTSA is getting exposed. Uh, I think people like John Greenwald have done it. We're gonna have him back on the show. Um, but, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a rejection in people who are looking at it seriously, but the entertainment aspects, they're gobbling it up, Gigi. They love the entertainment 
uh, they're pushed in the History Channel, you know, it's that kind of a thing. Yeah, and a lot of people will take in the information kind of like candy, not realizing that it goes into their subconscious mind. Right. And then when they start asking questions about their origins, it's like that's the first thing that comes forward, and that's all very purposeful. But I love that one of the things that you said, you said it to me years ago, a couple years ago, I think, um, but you said you called the UFO stuff deep consciousness studies. Right. And right. I think that's actually the truth is is that it is a, it, it is more about consciousness than it is anything else. Yeah, well, you know, you make a really good point, which is at the end of the day, um, that's how you're going to be able to engage it. Because it's almost like it's calling out to a different side of ourselves to understand that whole phenomena. Interestingly enough, um, when you get around the mystery school aspect, you know, it's almost like the mystery schools have opened us up to that ability. And one of the things in theosophy that Besant said would be a great legacy for theosophy is that humanity will understand and interact with other beings. And everyone thought, she's talking about elementals or, um, you know, the ascended masters. And it's true. <laughs> but obviously, she's, you know, that whole group was getting us into a higher level. Well, yeah, I think I think that you could use it in that way, but it could also be peer connections with other beings, other because um, yes. that's actually the next level. That's actually how you really get to know yourself as a planet is when you start um, engaging with other parts of the cosmos that follow a similar archetypal structure. We're still under God but it's a little bit different. And so when you start interacting with beings that are a little bit different than you, that's when you really get to know yourself. And that's when you really get to know earth is when you go way out. It's very difficult to do. It's very challenging to do. And in a lot of ways, we're not ready for that yet, clearly. But there is a beauty in it that she was perhaps predicting, like seeding the way. <laughs> Right, right, absolutely. Um, that's a good point, too, because you do have to go out <laughs> there. It's very different because, like you were saying about the mystery schools and the clues that they left about St. Germain, uh, they're not pushing it on you. You know, the, it's not like hitting you over the head with it. They're leaving a trail so that if you spend the time with it, you understand there's something different going on than what your ordinary consciousness is aware of. And there's a whole different level of consciousness that as a human being you can apprehend. I think that's the core of the mystery school teaching. It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of spiritual respect. Even if you are on a different level than someone spiritually right now, that this is a one time continuum, you know? Right. We, it's a sign of love and respect for another being is to not dominate them like that. Oh, um, absolutely. That's a sign for yourself. It, it's just a, it's a, it's a higher way of being, just to be honest. Well, um, <laughs> it's interesting because uh, Bennett, who was, uh, uh, J.G. Bennett, who was a disciple of uh, George Gurdjieff, he, you know, when he was developing these groups, he would found them, they would become so self-satisfied with the fourth way teaching and that he found over and over again, they were using it to put down other people to say like, well, I'm more conscious, I have this going on. And we do see that sometimes with people saying, hey, I'm at 5D, like I'm leaving you in the dust and like so much for humanity. Um, but obviously in the mystery school things, the minute you move up a level, the whole point is that you're able then to help other people. That, and that's, that's the joy is, is actually, it's a very high form of joy to be able to do that and actually when you start raising your frequency, your chakra system actually starts to function differently. Right. And you start to experience joy and inspiration in different ways. And it actually starts to be wired towards service because you're actually, it's like a higher circuits going on. You actually start to get energy differently than you would if you were only living in your lower chakras. And that's why people release materialism and things like that is because you actually start experiencing bliss differently. It's a totally different way of living. We can all share the same planet, mm -hmm. but we can be living and perceiving in completely different ways. Yes. Wow. Absolutely. Very well said. 
<laughs> Gigi, uh, really knocking it home tonight, everyone. You're watching The Dark Journalist Show, and we're going deep in X series episode 63 tonight. Um, I promised you more on Xy, and I promised you more on Tautzi, and now we're going to get to it. Um, it is interesting to keep the fundamentals in mind of the larger picture so that, you know, the mystery schools themselves, this breakthrough that they have there in the 19th century through the, the early 20th century is a reflection of this carrying the tradition. But of course, we know that since the Book of the Dead and, you know, the School of the Prophets and all these things, the mystery schools go back thousands and thousands of years. Pythagoras, oh my God, you know. Greeks. <laughs> uh, so it's way back there. And of course, Atlantis. So we're getting this slice, this kind of, you know, period, this breakthrough, this kind of almost Arthurian clash that happens in the 1840s with the mystery schools. And we, we had people like Steiner give us that, you know, uh, C.G. Harrison, who if you look at some of C.G. Harrison's works, it's literally like looking at somebody who's a journalist on the front lines of the mystery school wars and he's writing articles and in the form of these short lectures that he puts out. And I recommend his book, The Transcendental Universe um, from eight, you know, it's from 1888, I think. Um, wow. Yeah, and this is the interesting thing for me when I'm looking at these groups. And um, before we go back to the Tao Tse, you know, you have the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor they're rolling into the scene. Uh, they have a whole kind of setup. And Emma Britton uh, in the 1850s is associated with them. Um, you have the Theosophical Society in 1875 with Blavatsky, who's the final character that is the agreed upon character by the mystery schools. Okay, you know, this one special person can go out and try to unify these things with the Theosophical Society. Um, and of course you have Emma Britton with the Theosophical Society. It is interesting in all the work that we do over and over again, Emma Britton, a lot of it comes back to Emma Britton and now Zadkiel uh, coming around as well to Emma Britton. So we'll get to Zadkiel Tautzi a little more here. Marco Polo going back. One of the interesting things that he says is this group, the Tautzi, the one who's practicing Kabbalah and things like that, the second Tautzi, Oddly enough, all of their deities are feminine, <laughs> which is very different from the Buddhists and the Mongols and everything else. They have feminine deities, Gigi. But that's a very Pleiadian practice. True. <laughs> that's exactly. very, um, yeah, and that's, um, that's also reminds me of like the Tuatha, the Danan, mm -hmm. um, and that's also, kind of a little bit of a carryover from the previous sphere as well. Like that's a Mu quality um, as well, where the where the feminine was, it was more of a matriarchy and um, the feminine was more of the closer connection to God. Um, Interesting. Um, there's no question about it, that there's something, when you look at the Casey readings um, dealing with the two eye stone, it's all feminine. Uh, priestesses that are working it. The Orphic Circle, although it's men that are running the Orphic Circle, they use the seeress. Uh, they're using a feminine seer. Um, so we have, there's, there's this kind of uh, place that is occupied in esoteric work by the feminine mind that's very different. And one of the things that Steiner pointed out in this regard was that women developed memory first in his looking back with this kind of retro cognitive mind back to Atlantis, this is what he's seeing. And um, in his Atlantis uh, cosmic memory book, he says, well, women were naturally the leaders because they had the intuition and the memory first. And the men had a kind of physical skill. And he compared the etheric bodies and he said the male etheric body was deep in the earth and the the female etheric body was just hovering above it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, you need you need the masculine energy to kind of stabilize and protect and ground, and then the female goes and travels and and um, does it on every level, from giving birth and bringing a soul in and and giving birth to to going up and channeling. It's the same sort of 
um, process just in different forms. And one of the things that, that women have as well is really deep limbic systems and a lot, some more than others, but really strong emotional bodies. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the things that makes them really great mediums and stuff. It's this ability, ability that women have developed to enmesh. And um, that's actually where memory is often stored too, is, is in our emotions as well. Um, and so it's, it's a whole deep thing with women that, that allows them to connect with, but it's not, I mean, of course men can do it as well. There's great male um, intuitives and stuff, but there's, oh, yeah. something, there's something about it with women that's easy because of their, their, their depth. Well, it's interesting what you're saying about emotions there, because um, Emma Britton talks a lot in about the Orphic Circle. Is they had something that was called force, and it was strongly emotionally based. That it was a kind of control of emotions to let this flow come forward, and you needed that force. And predominantly, they got that from uh, their their female esoteric neophytes. So very, very interesting. Um, this idea of force again, energy force, bringing bringing forward that. And one of the things, when you look at the rules that Emma Britton put down that they had for the Orphic Circle and that she gave for spiritual circles later, they had certain rules in there, Gigi, like if someone were ill or if someone had recently suffered a disappointment, they weren't ideal to be in the circle. Right. Um, so what's happening there? The the kind of etheric magnetism is going to be less powerful? Yeah, well, if there's a circle of people, and this is why a lot of mystics don't actually like to go out in crowds or to concerts or, or, to, or to do anything like that, is when you, if you're doing something where you've trained yourself to become highly, highly, highly sensitive, especially like cosmic rays or something that's insanely sensitive, you're going to be picking up and merging with everybody's field around you. Mm -hmm. And that can affect the information because essentially um, once her consciousness sort of starts leaving her body, she's going to start referencing everything in the room, everything around her and pinging and referencing. That's a good thing if you've got a good group, because that means she can have more access. She can be more stabilized. She can get more stuff There's a synergy that can happen. But if one person doesn't like that person or one person doesn't feel good or there's whatever's going on, it's going to chop up the energy. It's going to break it up or it's going to um, just make it harder on, on, on everyone. So it does have to be, um, it does matter who's, and that's why it's don't play around too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good point, actually. That is fascinating that, um, you know, the actual success of an esoteric circle, of being able to achieve that consciousness, to open yourself up enough to get something out of it, to get improvement, to get healing, um, it has to be balanced just so. It's not something that can be rolled into in a random fashion. No, not if you're trying to do, I think, very precise things. I mean, if, if you're a psychic and you're just not even in a circle, but you're just trying to read for someone and that person doesn't believe that psychics even exist or that person is not feeling good, you're gonna you're gonna actually be picking up on all that energy too, and then you're gonna have to go and cleanse that off of you, and that's gonna be really really exhausting. Um, wow! Yeah, absolutely. It's like a, it's almost like an etheric residue. Yeah, and then you'll have to. Uh, you could even take it on physically, you know, things like that, um, or like you said, there could be weird poltergeist activity in the room. Um, right. So. Yeah. Well, the Kabbalah Essene Mystery School, the, the Essene Mystery School that is the real school of the prophets, and which um, Essene means expectancy. They were actually building up to the Christ on the mystery side of the Jewish uh, religion. And they had incredible purification in the desert there. Um, you know, they would fast. They, they really... Um, it's something that reminds me of the Marco Polo story about the Tao Tse, because he was saying these people, you know, they were ascetics, basically. They were hanging out and they weren't eating much and they were living this kind of, you know, um, 
kind of the destruction of the ego uh, type personalities where they were just getting by on the land and like they didn't have anything extravagant. And this opened them up and made them incredible, uh, gave them incredible abilities. Because the other stuff is more like a distraction <laughs> in a way when you get grossly material. Uh, everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. Fantastic crowd with us tonight. Um, and uh, we are surfing by on, uh, uh, we're doing a different live stream a programmer since they changed those and boy it's fun actually we're having a good time with it um and uh olivia is not with us uh in the regular uh, moderator role tonight but she's been around and she helped to put together the show and she is coming back strong probably labor day uh she'll be back with us for tonight we will take a few questions uh for gg we're coming up to the second half of the program now and you can ask those in caps, you know, maybe in about 20, 30 minutes, and I'll catch as many of those as I, I can. I won't do as good a job as Olivia does, obviously, but I'll, I'll take some of them and fire them at Gigi. Let's get to your big breakthrough, Gigi, because I thought this was remarkable. Um, this is the character, first of all, the Chinese character for TSC, see? And the... Um, the surname it's associated with, interestingly enough, is XIE, which is XE. XE. <laughs> um, the spelling H S I E H is most commonly used in Taiwan. The Cantonese spelling of the same Chinese character is C. Uh, and they go on from there. And um, I mean, <laughs> the odds of that as we're working on XE and Zadkill comes forward and he starts using this Zad kill tout C and then C means X C. It's quite remarkable. It's it's like it's almost like they left them there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the X steganography is in full force. <laughs> uh, Feels like that, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to uh, my X world. It it has that weird, very strange feeling. I remember I was researching uh, a program and it was the X fifteen. And I was like, well, the X-15 is, is, is the most hidden um, of the X-series planes. And it, you know, it had all these incredible features, and it was the perfect prototype for the x steganography that they use when they develop um, this, this incredible advanced technology aircraft. And uh, I said, you know, it would just make perfect sense if the X-15 was associated with like the paperclip Nazis, for example. And then boom, Walter Dornberger is the guy who made the X-15. This, this series and this research has a lot of interconnecting pieces like that, which I find remarkable. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't calculate them in regular research. They just show up. It's true. It's it's like, it's like there's help. <laughs> it's like there's help, exactly. Yeah. Uh, as we found out last year with the three hairs and all the mythology that you came across. Definitely. No question about it. Um, so a few things, I'm gonna summarize some of the findings of Marco Polo. One, um, this group had the ability or, or were accused of levitation. They were accused of not aging. GG, um, you know, <laughs> 50 years goes by and everyone at court gets old and these guys are still young. That sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> right. What's the problem, right? Yeah. Um, and so... What the, the people who were persecuting them said, they pretend that by means of certain exercises and meditations, one shall regain his youth and others shall at attain this terrestrial beauty in whose state every desire is gratified while they have the power to transport themselves from one place to another, however distant with speed and facility. Now that's from one of the, um, people with polo observing the fight that's going on back and forth. So they can transport themselves anywhere from one place to another. Wow. So, so they're basically either bilocating or they've got technology or they're that they're just that spiritually advanced. They could just think and they're there. Quite remarkable. Um, and it kind of winds up with them basically um, you know, they're upset that they're making themselves equivalent to the Indian rishis 
who uh, attain to supernatural powers. And that's the wedge that the Buddhists are able to use against them. Um, and they do, they get their, their books burned and they kind of get them thrown out of there. Um, now, Zadkiel, 800 years later, Richard Morrison, who is um, a Navy guy and a sophisticated astrologer who becomes uh, you know, in, in communication with the royal family and works with the Orphic Circle. Um, he eventually will be the person, as I described, who will be given the authorship name for Emma Britton's books. In other words, she says he's kind of writing these books through me. He elects to call himself Zadkiel Tautzi. The Tautzi, he was obviously familiar and aware of who they were and what they did. He understood the inner workings of this group that could do these things. The fact that we now move on down the line with the Orphic Circle and get around Lewis Carroll and Exe and all these characters, are you seeing what I'm seeing here, which is that he's aware that there's a group that could do this and he's taking the name as a kind of a key to having access to those people. Yeah. It's like its own steganography. It's yeah. like its own, its own, its own thing. And I guess that's what's being revealed now is another little key to, to look at. Right. Exactly. We have, um, there's something very interesting in this name and that it's attached to Jupiter one, uh, that it's attached to St. Germain, who we know is a mainstay in the mystery schools. Um, and they all agree on his presence and his presence on a higher level. And I say they all in terms of the ones um, that we point to on this program, like the Casey uh, material and anthroposophy and theosophy. Um, but it brings us around to this larger question of what the nature of that battle was and what is somebody like Zadkiel you know, how does that relate with the name to what they were trying to do, pulling forward this consciousness out of the mystery schools and into the public realm? So this is definitely where we are. I'm going to read a couple of interesting things that might give us a clue uh, on this. And um, now, Bulwer Lytton, who is, is a fascinating character, and I, I bring him up in this program, I highly recommend his books, including uh, The Coming Race. Um, and he wrote all the books about Vril. And uh, of course, his books take place underground and in The Coming Race. Um, there's a whole group underground that's getting ready to take over what's above ground. Uh, and Vril is that special life force energy that they're gonna use to do it. And it's basically more powerful than anything. Now, uh, Blavatsky and Steiner, Rudolf Steiner, identified Bulwer Lytton as an initiate from these mystery schools. So they were putting him one on the same level as them, but also seeking into his information for the insights. So obviously even giving him more credit than uh, themselves. Um, he brings in all of these Rosicrucian themes, which again is that Western esoteric mystery school tradition. But he was asked, in 1870 um, about his association with Rosicrucians. And he is also does an interesting cagey thing, a la Saint Germain, and I'm gonna read this. This is his quote. There are reasons why I cannot enter the subject of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood. A society still existing, but not under any name by which it can be recognized by those without its pale. Some time ago, a sect pretending to style itself Rosicrucian and arrogating to itself full knowledge of the mysteries of the craft communicated with me. And the, in reply, I sent them the cipher sign of the, quote, initiate. Not one of them could construe it. So he had a test there, a kind of litmus test for who actually was involved with the genuine Rosicrucian Brotherhood, which apparently doesn't call itself Rosicrucian anymore. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I mean, if you're not, if you don't know the symbol, then I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the symbol is this, the 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 um, almost the source of the information, the source of the 
um, channeling the source of the, you know, what, what their work is. And if you don't know that on the higher level, then you're not, how could you say that you are that? Absolutely. Um, well, that's a great point. <laughs> Actually, the fact that they have this, you have to think on the mystery school level, you know, it's impossible for them to be fooled because they have the information. In the public realm, here we are, we need to be able to develop those tools that'll help us not to get, you know, we, we've seen so many marketing activities, for example. Um, you know, we've seen Intel, thing. we were talking about TTSA before and all the things that we've exposed um, coming in from that marketing thing. And I often say that we're caught in this work between these marketing forces that are coming in and forcing a narrative. And then on the other side, the Intel force is coming in. They have a very narrow corridor under which you and I can operate in the public realm about this information. It's there though, however it is there. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is he's sort of giving us a lesson that this is 1870. Remember they have 150 years of sophistication now. Um, authenticity, Gigi, it's hard to come by. It is hard to come by, especially when you have these two forces abiding by completely different rules. So you have people that will gladly just toss the secrets out for $9.95 or join my mystery school online or whatever it is, and they'll gladly give it to you, like here, you know, um, versus real teachers or real spiritual individuals that are going to prioritize where your consciousness is and they're going to make you earn it a little bit more. There's much more of a genuine spiritual interaction going on, one that you may not even realize. And so you have these two forces that are polarizing everything, but they behave in completely different ways. Right. And so it's not like there's two different forces that play the same game. They're all playing dirty. It's like, no, there's this, there is a, a descending force that steals and plagiarizes and corrupts good material. And then there's a, and then there's a, there's a higher dimensional good force that has a different code of eth ethics of respect. But you have to work harder for that. And it's just like we were saying earlier is that there's different, it's polarized, but there's different rules. Uh -huh. And people need to learn to notice, well, maybe this isn't good information because they're not, res they're really throwing it out there. They really want me to believe it. They're really pushing it. And it's like, well, maybe that's not how this should be. Maybe I should be respected a little bit more. Maybe my consciousness isn't a commodity. Oh, it's an entirely different way of interacting with information. Absolutely. Uh, and I think people do have a kind of a, an Achilles heel in general, which is they're so used to being marketed to. And uh, that, that becomes a major issue. One thing that I learned, uh, it's a fantastic quote from Gurdjieff, which I think rings true whenever we get around these subjects is the, the what to do is always public. This is the, again, the exoteric circle. This stuff is out there, what to do, you know, in religions, turn the other cheek, um, you know, don't judge your neighbor, things like this, the fundamental spiritual tenets, do unto others. But then he said that the how to do it is kept underground because when it's out there, it's always persecuted. Yes. So uh, the tools, the ways and the means are completely kept under wraps. Uh, so the how to do it is something you need to go and physically find. But the weird, the interesting thing is, is, is that if you can get yourself in the right frequency through meditation and taking care of yourself and being kind and doing what's out there, you know, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of things that we, you can start to work with you will find yourself synchronistically drawn to exactly what you need to know when you need to know it, like you're doing with the X series and everyone has times in their life. So we actually have enough information in the public right now to do incredible things. We just need initiative um, and we need people to start clicking in. Oh, no question. <laughs> you're making me think of a lot of good Gurdjieff quotes tonight. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, the, this is in, in Ospensky's book, but he said, the fundamental problem with the students that I have coming to me is that they all expect a complete roast pheasant dinner to float magically into their mouths without preparing it. Uh, and I think that that gets to the point that you're talking about, which is there are all these things here already. 
you know, we have the incredible legacy of the mystery schools, and that's uh, that's information that we need to assimilate and be able to apply. Yeah, not don't just and the eating metaphor is great because what do we do? We just turn on YouTube and watch eight documentaries and eat cheesies <laughs> or, or, or whatever it is we're doing. We're, we're we're literally just consuming it and like nothing. We're not working with it. Right. Know? So. I like that the eight documentaries and you're staring right at me on that one. <laughs> I've been watching Daniel. <laughs> we are, um, you know, we're looking into some interesting contexts around um, XE. And I thought one thing that would be important and I tried really hard and I thank God I got lucky is I try to find a picture of XE as an adult, um, which what I think is fascinating when we look at Exie and her amazing royal connections and the fact that she was so tightly um, sort of into Lewis Carroll's world when he's working on the second book. She's kind of a major key and the ex diganography is right in her name. Um, and she's named Alexandra after Queen Alexandra. Um, so we're looking at something kind of quite remarkable with her. And I thought that there's always something in the eye with the picture for me. I can always tell um, if something's legitimate or not, or I get a feeling from it. I found a picture, it's the only picture of Exie as an older woman. And uh, here it is, and Gigi, it's signed. She's still using <laughs> Exie, X-I-E, unbelievable. And there she is. She seems very sassy. Yes, I know. She's incredibly well-dressed. Um, and also, I guess, um, there's something maybe about this individual that was intensely psychic to start with. And so I think that my thinking uh, in general on the Alice in Wonderland, Alice Through the Looking Glass initiation is works something like this, that Emma Britton is the kind of fundamental archetype that they use for Alice in Wonderland. She's the one that was, after all, Blavatsky said she never met anyone who had the mediumistic abilities of Emma Britton, which is pretty amazing for her to say. <laughs> um, so she was the prototype and she was the one who was, as a young person, um, you know, brought forward this incredible spirit of being able to be a somnambulist trance channel. Um, by the way, to some things that you've said about the way that you do your trances, I thought you'd find this interesting, which is the more I get into her material, they're saying that later in life, when she's in her 40s and 50s, she's starting to do some of her psychic work the way that you do. That is, she's not going into those deep trances anymore. She is doing a process where she's calling it blending. Mm. information she's coming in is blended with her conscious uh, mind and she'll give those lectures that way kind of interesting that is and that is interesting I definitely relate to that I don't do any type of somnambulistic anything at all <laughs> um, yeah well, apparently the, the Orphic circle the way that they were set up um, where they were all somnambulist mm -hmm. trance and something about going into that level of trance and because they were, their average age was 11 or 12. Yeah, well that's yeah. different. It's, a, it's an easier level in a way to let go of your personality and go into that. Oh, I couldn't have done this. No, I had, no, no. Like there, if, if I was, when you're younger, you're not. There's like different sort of initiations into psychic, psychic ability, I think throughout your life, if you'll have them. Yes. Um, if you take the initiative to regain them or develop them. But no, I mean, if I was doing the type of psychic readings and, or work I was doing now, I would just be completely overwhelmed. I wouldn't even have a lexicon to understand anything. So um, the, mm -hmm. when, you, when you do the sort of more Emma Britton style stuff, you basically become all of your past lives in a way Oh, wow. And, and everything that you've ever been. And it's just a whole big, huge 
thing. You have to become wider every day. You have to become kind of like your heart has to become wider and wider and wider and wider. Um, and uh, you have to give, you almost have to like give yourself away. And I, it's hard to explain, but there's a, there's a whole loss with it that you can't do when you're, um, when you're young. Yeah. No, no question about it. It's almost like that uh, development of that young mind has, is in such a state that it can rise up out of itself because it's not so attached to ideas and concepts yet. And yeah, that, that, that too, that too. It's sort of like a whole different, it's just a whole different kind of style. I mean, children are so beautiful. I mean, just the things that they say and like just how they are, they're just so beautifully, naturally psychic. And well, they're in touch. Yes, they're in touch with something which the society loses. Yeah, they're just so truthful. And you're like, yeah, why did I ever bother thinking differently? Like they just get it. <laughs> they're perfect. You know? um, someone I want to bring in here is a wild card. Strangely, there's some of this relates to some of your course and background too. Uh, I want to mention this that uh, Hiram Corson is someone who we found that um, he had an incredible kind of religious uh, impact in the late 19th century. But one of the unusual things that he did is he allowed um, Helena Blavatsky to come and work on the Isis Unveiled in his cottage there in, um, <laughs> in, I think it was outside of Philadelphia. And um, his name was Hiram Corson and he was a distant offshoot of your family line. And we found quite a few, including uh, his son and his grandson. And some of them get very deep into the kind of layers of government and, and things like that. But what fascinates me is that once in a while, we'll run across someone with the name Corson, uh, who is in these circles directly. And it's so interesting when we look into your background, thinking about how Emma Britton had, you know, this incredible Welsh wizard as a grandfather, and that was the bloodline that she came through, carrying that psychic tradition. And then we kind of got some answers on your psychic abilities, not all, but by finding out a little bit about this background. Yeah, no, it was it was, it was really, um, really incredible. I obviously, for people that don't know, um, my mother, um, her, her, her maiden name is Corson and her father died very strangely and very tragically. And so she never got to know her father and her mother, her mother remarried and there was a weird court suit like lawsuit that went on between my grandmother about the death of my, it was all very strange. And so I never thought about them. I never really, some, I have an uncle that would come around and of course we're Canadian. We're like the, we're, we're like the weirdo Canadian branch. That just like, I live like Heidi in the mountains, you know, kind of <laughs> from that kind of in a way. Yes. And I discovered this with you and it was all very, very synchronistic and, um, yeah, I still don't know. I just go. I just go with the flow as usual. <laughs> I yeah. Well, there are theosophical aspects to it. There's no question about it. Um, I was doing some research on um, Pascal Beverly Randolph, who was an incredible. Uh, you know, around he's pre Theosophy. He's around 1850s, and he writes a series of books, and he takes these journeys to Egypt and he gets initiated and he has an unusual psychic ability. Um, he takes on the role of being Native American sometimes, he takes on the role of being African, uh, but it's apparently he's French German and we don't really know much about his actual background. Um, but I do find that his kind of fitting in, shape-shifting into these different roles is quite interesting. Um, but his work was having a powerful impact and interestingly enough, and this is something that we're going to go into in a different episode, but he uh, he comes to Boston around the time that Emma Britton is here launching the Western Star, which is the early version of Theosophy. And uh, he's here and he's doing what will become the inspiration, the foundation for the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. And it is uh, all of these different types of uh, sort of psychic exercises. And he's known as a very interesting medium. Well, there's a great fire in Boston 
that uh, takes place, and it's in the 1870s. And as a result of it, um, Emma Britton's work kind of gets unraveled for a while, the things that she was doing. And he is in Boston as well and has met uh, with her, but um, there's not a lot of, it doesn't look like there's so much of a coordinated activity between them. I think that they may have been, uh, even though they, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor seems to have a thread with both of them, there seems to be um, not a lot of cohesion between the two. In any case, the accident throws him to uh, Ohio, where he finds an opportunity in Ohio, and he has to leave Boston. And uh, this is a shot of Pascal here, just a quick idea. And we will go more deeply into him and his relation to the Orphic Circle. He did meet Bulwer Lytton um, on his travels. And some of the comments about him that came out from Blavatsky uh, were very interesting as well, where she said, you know, uh, Pascal was only half initiated into these mystery schools and his work is problematic. And then eventually, um, you know, there's an aspect of his work, which uh, she really says is, is just like, don't go near it. And um, now it's quite interesting to me, but before all this, he goes to Ohio and he gets into this accident and he meets this woman there and her name, she's a 19 year old girl and she's already running these mediumistic uh, seances and her name is Kate Corson. And she is this kind of waspy uh, Ohio woman and she's in the middle of, you know, kind of country farmland and out of nowhere, she meets this incredible innovator and she forms something called Kate Corson and Company Books and they release esoteric titles. Um, and he doesn't live much longer. He dies shortly after that. But and that the when they were married, he was something like in his 50s and she was 20 or something like that. And uh, so it's a very unusual story. But there it was again, Gigi, the kind of Orphic Circle in the middle of Ohio and the name was Corson. Yeah, that's strange. And they had like they had a child that they like they named it Osiris Buddha. Yes, Osiris Buddha. I, that's pretty esoteric. That's that's like you know east east meets west, <laughs> you know, and then it's yeah. I want to recommend uh, if people are interested in more about Pascal. It's a great book by Jocelyn Godwin, uh, who's done some good work on these areas. Again. The only thing that I have a problem with when I get into his work is that he is coming in kind of skeptically to the whole thing, but uh, he does give the subject enough breathing room to get to the facts, which I really love. Um, and his book on this was called The Theosophical Enlightenment, and there is a very good section on Pascal there, um, and it'll, I think it'll give us kind of a hint. One of the fascinating things that was in this book uh, was a recounting of um, Queen Victoria being interested in these crystals and this whole thing about Zadkiel. I'm gonna read this real briefly. Um, and it is, it's basically giving us that fundamental understanding that Queen Victoria did have that esoteric deep, deep interest. And that as a result, she was able to select this woman, Alexandra, for her son who became Queen Alexandra and she became Exe's godmother. That's the, the thread there that I'm trying to draw up. So let's get a real quick look on this. And this is short. Um, so the name that they use, because she's using kind of a pseudonym when she contacts these people is Victoria Regina. And she says, I very much wish to know whether I am to become a writing medium as I wish to communicate with my father. I've been informed by the CA that it is not your father's spirit, but the evil spirit of your uncle that visits him. Um, these are the answers is kind of back and forth that goes on. So she's asking these questions and she says, oh, indeed, I shall be very sorry if anything to do with such things. My husband, Prince Albert, is also very anxious about the crystal. He has one in his possession, but he does not thoroughly understand it. He would be very glad for you to give him any information about it. Are you, are you not acquainted with Mr. I blank, one of my pages? 
And then the response is yes. And if Mr. Gerning will give you my address, I will give them full instructions upon the subject or Earl Stanhope, who is also a member of the Orphic Circle. So, um, and then she says, I do not know Earl Stanhope. He does not attend court. And then the answer is, oh, then I will inquire about you when I return to Windsor Castle. And if I can find you out, I will certainly send for you. And she says, I thank you. Now, um, this is the exchange that they have. What's interesting about all that is when we were talking in the other episode about the mirror and the scrying mirror and Alice through the looking glass, um, there's a whole thing about magic mirrors, of course, and that is all about this crystal activity. She's interested in, and Prince Albert apparently has a crystal, um, and they're all interested in it because Zadkiel um, is doing these astrological predictions using this crystal. So um, that gives us a fundamental idea, since those people, the Earl of Stanhope and Morrison, who's Zadkiel, are both in the Orphic Circle, that the queen is directly involved with the Orphic Circle. Mm -hmm. So now we're starting to get the picture. It's starting to open up there. Um, but Gigi, something about, again, the royal lineage and the royal blood going into this occult area. Yeah, well, I mean, it would make sense. I mean, I think, well, there's always a divine right of mm -hmm. kings, King. you yeah. know, um, and, 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 you know, blue bloods and, and, and the bloodline there. Um, it could be, a, I mean, if you think about it, most regular people don't have the access or the time to necessarily develop that. But, you know, obviously that was a tradition that they, you know, kept going. It was really important and that could represent them at one point even being part of a priest class or, or, or a priestess class. It's hard to, to really understand, I think, like today because the royalty is, is in much different condition today than maybe what it was originally uh, based in. So, but the, some of the traditions could still be going on and the access is still there, even though I think it's degenerated, you know, at this point, but the, the, some of the things are going on are still going on. Um, you know, that's really interesting because <laughs> I think about Queen Elizabeth and her long reign and how uh, all the geopolitical things, you know, I won't get into a thing about Queen Elizabeth, but she certainly, um, you know, she she's involved herself in areas of government um, and, you know, helped to do things like oust the, the Australian prime minister and things like that, which... Uh, so I think that you're right, that, <laughs> that it is a kind of degeneration from the level that they had it. What I find so interesting when we're looking at the royal family, when we're looking at these influences, is that there's a period back there where the, the mystery school wars are taking place and they want a role in it. Um, you know, this is why we find even with Blavatsky, um, you know, they they try at a certain level to kind of control her output. They try to control what she's dishing out. And um, I think that they, in some sense, uh, that one of the major keys that we get from Steiner's work is that the geopolitics that we see operating, whether it's in America, especially in America, or in the UK, according to Steiner, is driven almost completely by the mystery schools, either of the traditional... Um, Western esoteric or of the left-hand path, which were, you know, would be more what we would think of as kind of black magicians. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely believe that. I think it's been that way since Atlantis, and I just think it just hasn't really changed. Um, I think it's just a continuation of, of what's still going on. And, you know, when it comes to royalty or any leaders, even though it's kind of out of vogue for people to use psychics publicly, like you said, you had Jane Dixon and Nixon. We were just talking about the czars. They had Rasputin. Yes. Um, and so every, yeah, so every, and you even have um, John D. obviously. All right. So every leader wants, whether they talk about it or not, they want the best psychics because they want to know timelines. They want to know the overall tone of energy, when to do things, going beyond astrology. Like they want to know these things and whoever can know these things has more power 
at the end of the day. And that's the truth. Whoever can see timelines, whoever knows what's coming, whoever can sense an energy is going to have more power. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's that incredible advantage. Um, and you talked about Gene Dixon. You know, it was funny what came out about Gene Dixon and we did a series of programs on her and Nixon is the way that that was all discovered was because somebody was looking for information after 9-11 about presidents and what they did about terrorism. And they looked for different uh, task forces that were in different administrations. And they found that around terrorism, they had 88 visits from Gene Dixon to the Nixon White House. And obviously she was giving him psychic readings about the things that were happening. And oddly enough, uh, when we have Nixon predicting Trump will become president, we wonder really who's doing the predicting there. Right, and, <laughs> and also, yeah, exactly. And also, well, not a probably not a good school. <laughs> I mean, I have I'm a little skeptical, I have to say, because of the the cycle that we're in is a, is a the end of a Kali Yuga cycle. Mm -hmm. What that means is that everything has reached peak corruption. Oh uh, yeah. And so we have to look at everything very skeptically, especially who's in power and and things like that. But um on the topic of great leaders having great psychics, we also have Abraham Lincoln and Emma Britton. I mean, yes. just named five and we weren't even trying. So, I mean, it's it's the best kept secret. No question. And what's fascinating is Emma was doing the mediumistic uh, trance work for Lincoln, but he sent her on speaking tours. She was such a good speaker to kind of like promote uh, his agenda through the Civil War. And she went through the South doing that. Quite amazing. Yeah, that is. And it's the magnetism, I think. Right, exactly. Well, she's no shrinking violet for sure. <laughs> she can take on uh, Helena Blavatsky. Um, everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. We are here. It's episode X63, and we're going to take some questions uh, for Gigi Young, who's our guest, and ask them all in caps. I'll do my best. Hey, I'm no Olivia, but I, I know I can tag. No you. one's Olivia. <laughs> But uh, I want to remind uh, you also to go to ggyoung.com. That's where uh, her courses are. And you can also find a lot of her amazing videos on YouTube. And I highly recommend the series that uh, Gigi is doing now, which is In Plain Sight, um, which I think, Gigi, you're doing a great job of video storytelling there as well, I think. I leave things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's more like it. Um, but ask the questions all in caps, and I'll grab them. Oh, was Mary Todd Lincoln Illuminati? That's an interesting one. I yeah. that's all you. <laughs> <laughs> what does Illuminati mean? This is like yeah. This is like I feel like we're at we're at a point where we really need to grow up with the like like the terms that we're using. Like what is an Illuminati? Like what is that? What is that to you? You know, like what like what does that mean? It is. It's the catchphrase. It, there's no doubt. It's the catch-all for um, this that group, and it's the group that controls things and uses a cult wishy-washiness to do it. Now, what's interesting for me is if you really look at it, um, there are letters between Washington and Ben Franklin warning about the Bavarian Illuminati. So we know in their time there was an actual group in Germany um, that they were they didn't you know they knew that they were up to no good, and it was some kind of association of banking stuff with occult stuff. So that much is pretty clear. But Good, we have some specifics then. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Later, I mean, it's interesting because when we think of the secret societies, um, it really is, by the time you get to Lincoln's time, uh, you know, it, it becomes the groups like Theosophy in 1875, a little after Lincoln, Anthroposophy, that become the big public face of that. But in between, you have like Golden Dawn, uh, you know, all the stuff that um, Crowley did and all the rest of it, that it, it's like there's this cauldron of information that's bubbling up and everyone who's in those circles has access to it. And they can do, you know, you can point it towards a very noble cause. Uh, you can point it towards politics. You can point it towards domination. You know, so it, the information is rising up and this is part of the danger that the mystery schools uh, saw. But certainly there was an Illuminati and the idea that we've kind of thrown it out there as a hashtag or as a, a kind of a catch-all for um, like a, a YouTube title is tricky because it doesn't mean 
uh, anything to just flash the name. But I will say this about Mary Todd Lincoln, which is she had incredible interest in, especially with the death of her son, in contacting him. And so the mediumistic, psychic, um, spiritualist craze that was going, she was so very into. Um, so no, I don't really think she was Illuminati, but great question. Let's see if we can get Gigi's question. Uh, every, everyone, so far so good. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you, Gigi, um, when you are psychic, when you have those abilities, let's say someone listening now, of course, everyone has some psychic ability as you've stated, but when someone is psychic, um, how do you go into it in a way that um, you don't open yourself up to someone else's um, darker side? You have to live in a way that is loving. Uh -huh. so you do, you really, I mean, it's really cheesy, but you have to try to make it so your energy, your bioenergetic field is resonating at a certain level. And that's what really protects you is your resonance. You want to be um, within a certain spectrum and that's through positivity. That's what people say optimism works. It's not just like optimism is feel good. It genuinely raises your frequency so that your perception changes and your perspective changes. So you see it, you actually see a different world because your energy changes because you're choosing to take the initiative and make something positive. So that, that actually really does help. The moment that you start getting bogged down with negativity and frustration, the field of your heart actually changes. It becomes incoherent. It becomes choppy and weird. And that's when things start going on is when you're afraid or when you're frustrated and you hang out in these negative emotions too much psychically, that's when you start resonating and you can essentially attract to you your own fears. Mm. Um, and so it really has to do with like spiritual hygiene and, and, and self-development. Um, it's an internal thing. Well, it's fascinating. You know, um, when I've noticed this with people that I know who are sensitive, who work on Twitter and when they go out there and they, will run across like a negative um, voice or troll or whatever. And it's interesting, I think it operates under the same rule, which is you have to be able to engage while staying shielded energetically from those types of interactions. And it's really hard sometimes because sometimes things really get you. Yeah. And they're just, it's that thing that you really don't like, or you're just having a bad day and it's okay to have bad days too, but it totally is like, even in just a normal sense, like, I there's always going to be something that's going to make you mad on Twitter. You, know? <laughs> you have to have that discipline. That's like, I'm going for a walk now. <laughs> I'm going to go take care of that. Yeah. Well, that's what it is. It's one of your famous hikes. That's your recipe. Oh yeah. The hike. Okay. If you're ever feeling bad, just take your shoes off and go walk in nature or just go be in nature. Cause nature has this way of combing your energy field and the trees will talk to you. I was actually hiking yesterday and a tree fell, a, a, a tree fell like right across from me. Like just wow. fell over. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see, so you get to see that. <laughs> yep. Lots of things happening. Yeah. Uh, well, I've heard about some of your hikes. I <laughs> like get lost and like, it's really, a mess. <laughs> it's really a mess guys. Anyway. I find it interesting. I do think that connection to nature stuff uh, it has it has a, a few um, things that are hidden. It's such an instant recipe. I remember when Alexandra Bruce, uh, she produced a movie about earthing and grounding. And um, it was so interesting because I was like, that's the first thing that's so available to everyone pretty much. I mean, in the city, I guess it's tough a little bit, but there's always somewhere you can go. Um, I can also say that the 5G, sorry to interrupt, but um, the, uh, David Icke was saying that the 5G um, is like a millimeter wave or a short wave and it's interrupted by trees. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So. That's really interesting. It's funny you mentioned like, because someone just asked in the questions, are there reptilian bloodlines, which is kind of a trapdoor question, but you're welcome. That's it. We can, well, see, the thing is, is it's like, I was actually playing with this idea a little bit recently because when I, when I've had memories and seen the blue beings, mm -hmm they're more aquatic. So there's like an aquatic thing. And I think people get the aquatic level mixed up with reptilians because they're very similar. 
And I feel like there's a lot of past, one thing that I've noticed psychically is there's a lot of past timelines that are dark, uh -huh. where Earth failed, that are kind of connected to Mars and sometimes the moon and like the right. atmosphere and the grays. There's all these kind of unsuccessful human timelines on Earth that didn't work out and they're now descending timelines and they're heavy and they're also connected with transhumanism because you know the transhumanism makes us denser. Adding parts to your heart and your brain makes it so you can't sense spirit anymore. It chops your energy up. And that's kind of, there, there's negative reptilians associated with that and Mars. And so what people are doing is they're associating and remembering that level, but there's also good bloodlines that are, it's, it's almost like they're choosing to associate with that and that's why mm -hmm. they're like possessed by that. But there's also bloodlines that have other ET connections. So you couldn't really just say that like all um, hybrid bloodlines are technically uh, reptilian bloodlines. It's definitely an association with a regressive timeline and a level of possession going on. Um, and, you know, David Icke, um, he brought this forward, but he brought it forward in a time when we didn't understand interdimensionality. And yeah. so he said something very literal that was happening interdimensionally. Uh -huh. yeah. So that's what people, he, people give him a really hard time about that, but like, that's how you would think that back then. So like it, it you know. Oh yeah, well, it's, I mean, he was writing in the nineties there. Yeah, so he yeah. did it perfectly for, for what, he, he gets a lot of flack for it, but it makes sense what he's, he's talking about an overlay, an interdimensional overlay. Um, so. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? That's your, <laughs> your David Icke moment of the evening. Now, I think it's interesting. Um, see, the funny thing is the, the reptilian thing became such a catch-all again. And I think that that's what the problem is over and over again, which is something becomes a theme and it's latched onto. And uh, I think when you are dealing on an energetic level, when I've seen some of the paintings of William Blake, who's around these characters in the Orphic Circle, the things that he's painting that he's seeing on an astral plane, when, they're, when they are darker, he, they do look reptilian. There's no question. I've even seen that myself. I've seen yes. dark, heavy, metallic. It always... There's always like a, I can feel it now. Just talk is bringing it back. But yeah, it's um, it, it definitely is around. There's definitely certain creatures that you see, and reptilians are are one of them. I'll make you think Pleiadian, Gigi. You're going into the Pleiadians, so you're looking into that. You do that with your psychic stuff, which is when you go into a topic, you start to experience it. Uh, I, that's very interesting. I know that there are psychics who are on a mental level. But around you, it's always a physical, it feels like, not always, but it's a physical thing that happens. Oh, yeah, every, I have to stop it, because then I'll just be like, <laughs> not now, let's not do that. <laughs> um, Gigi, if what we're talking about tonight, again, largely the Orphic Circle, 95% of it's completely secret. We don't even know um, the things that they were doing. We What we have is firsthand testimony from Emma Britton. Thank God. But the legacy of these groups, good and bad, um, from the Orphic Circle, Theosophy, Golden Dawn, which is a mixed bag, um, what is the legacy now that we have forward after that battle with groups like Anthroposophy carrying the banner and Steiner bringing forward the harmonic? Uh, information and the eight sphere information. What is the legacy of that battle and that opening up of all this information? Well, I think that the legacy, hmm, the legacy would be that I think people have a choice now, I think right now, um, which side they almost want to choose. That's part of the legacy. And, um, I think some of the predictions that they made are definitely coming true. So we're definitely living in a legacy that they predicted in a lot of ways. And I think that all of these techniques and all of these things are um, here for us to use in, 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 more, in more of a way than ever has really existed. And I think that's really ironic considering how dark times are now. It's like we have more information. I mean, you can just download some of the greatest 
teachers around. So oh, yeah. the legacy is kind of, it, it's, it's interesting. Oh yeah, you can sit and listen to hours of Manly P. Hall. That That's would have been like something that, I mean, to listen to, to, to that work would have been like, you would have had to travel in, in horse and buggy, or you'd have to get papers or mm -hmm. get a book or get a manuscript, or you'd have to try to get into a circle where there was channeling going on and you would have had to, it would have been so slow, you know, and you'd have to earn their trust or, or whatever was going on. It, it was just so much different. Like now you can get decent and you just have to discern it. That's the tough part now. Yeah. But it's all, it's almost like it's all here for for people to choose. Um, oh, no question. No question. It's, maybe we uh, can do more of it. Maybe people can start doing, doing more openly spiritual things and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what I find so interesting is how pertinent their battle was then, say, when this original struggle occurred. I always cap it around to 1875 because Theosophy started then. Um, so, you know, looking at almost 150 years of the struggle to get this information out and really transform society with it, while side by side we were developing atomic rockets and, you know, uh, creating this transhumanist disaster for the 21st century, right there, right lighting, sort of gliding right beside it is access to incredible power of that knowledge. It is, and it's, it's yeah, we're really facing off with it in a way that I don't really, maybe comparison only the atomic bomb was like, it's really, really I mean, now we're actually talking about bombing Mars. Right. That legacy, like actually the battle's actually going off world at this point, <laughs> right, right. you know, it, it's yeah. going into weird levels and it's like the battle is continuing, but it's splitting into more deeper, I think more public ways. Um, How incredibly stupid that this idea of bringing war into space and making space a war fighting domain um, the, these are the bad ideas, you know, just like the Space Force. It needs to be looked at completely differently. When I look back to JFK's vision for space, it was to guarantee that space would be a place that would have peace treaties, you know, implicit in its design with us going out there, which is why he wanted to forego a space race and do a joint mission to the moon with the Russians at the time. That's the kind of, uh, you know, there needs to be an ethical call around space. Right now, I think there's a lot of um, sort of fantasy stuff uh, around it. And I think there's also an awful lot of, of the privatization ideas, you know, asteroid mining and space tourism and stuff. They're not thinking about it. They're thinking like, you know, you can open a McDonald's in space. That's not the way to look at it. <laughs> I mean, you need to move the culture forward, at, at, you know, when you get these things going. And um that is the really crucial thing. I will take a couple of questions for you, Gigi, here. Um, Kanye West, I'm not sure we can answer much about Kanye West, <laughs> fortunately. And the John's question is, is this live? Yes. Oh, we're live. We're live. We're very live. We're so live. Yeah. Uh, is the dragon Aramon? No, the dragon is Aramon. You answered your own question. That's pretty good. Um, I think, I think as we go through these, someone picked up the McDonald's in space. I, you know, what I'd like to do is really say that we have great people out there tonight. It's great to see so many excellent people. Um, yeah, well, it looks like in terms of asking questions in CAPT, I can't really pick out too many. But um, one thing I will say in terms of your work, Gigi, and some of the things that we get into tonight, it's funny for me because um, the work that you do and the way that you psychically work, whenever I get around things like the Orphic Circle, I, I feel that, uh, you know, they understand the value of psychic work. And this is what I think is missing fundamentally that there's a trick now where people who are doing psychic work, um, they seem to be falling into this kind of, marketing thing or that it has to be this incredibly profitable enterprise or it has you know there has to be something attached to it which is this big ego aspect 
And what I think that we lose there is that people uh, look and view, it's almost like an infantile level that we look at the psychic part with. And uh, it would be great, the society would benefit greatly from growing up to um, acquire those tools of soul expression. Uh, so it would be, you know, this incredible leap for the culture. But over and over again, you see that pushed back against um, in, you know, traditional things so that they, they try very often to dismiss psychic work in academia, for example. Yeah, there's this whole on one side, you know, you want to they, they want to stop it entirely. Um, when psychic ability is just higher perception of higher energy fields, it's, it's completely practical, actually. Um, or even within the psychic community, you have people who are probably too wounded to really genuinely start practicing. Uh, and then they kind of, because there, there, there isn't enough good training programs and schools that can genuinely help read someone's energy and work with them to develop their abilities and practice at a good rate. I think you said that, you know, with the mystery schools, I heard you say once that a lot of the time they didn't really even start practicing until 40. Yes. And um, that's something to consider. You know, you, that was the old tradition where you weren't really considered a great teacher until you were 40. Um, and so we have a lot of people who are practicing too soon and they think that they're better than they are. Right. And another problem is, is that a lot of people think that when you start doing readings that every psychic is tapping into the same place, the other side, the other side, it's like the same place. The other side is actually many different densities and dimensions. And you can tap into the lower part of that or you can tap into the higher part of that. And if you start tapping into the lower part, which is the lower astral, and working in that, you start tapping into some stuff that will tell you, you know, you should have a fence around your house soon because you're basically going to be so famous and you're going to be so wealthy. You're going to be so incredible. You're the best at this. And you will have entities that will tell you things like this. And you should just go and satisfy all of those lower chakra urges that you want. Uh -huh. And it becomes hedonistic and it becomes might is right. And it becomes all about you. And that is one of the first initiations that every mystic has to pass is those lower chakras. And, and we can, it, it may not be as serious because our age is so materialistic, but if you're obsessed with money and marketing and pushing yourself, it's not that you shouldn't earn a living. You definitely should. But if that's at the front of your mind and you're frothing at the mouth, then that is some lower astral stuff and that will drain you and you're not going to serve anybody. So we need to know the difference between yeah, you can get psychic information by tapping into the lower astral, but it's it's not your genius. Right. Your genius is beyond that, and you want to get to your genius, and and we want to get society to the point where we're connecting with that more and more and more, because that's when you start having incredible inventions and incredible healers and incredible in everything. So. Wow! Absolutely. Um, I even think that's the message of the whole ascended master aspect from Theosophy. And, uh, you know, it seems to me the emphasis in Steiner's work, he talked about the masters, but he didn't emphasize them as much. I think he was seeing this point where we have to kind of take their example and apply it. It's, it's this incredible period of, you know, saying the teenager becoming an adult. Uh, this seems to be the period that we're in. It is exactly. And, and we have so much great. Actually, the 1800s, I didn't realize this until I started talking to you, is that Oh, there's a lot of like this whole starseed movement and everyone connecting with their cosmic consciousness is so incredible. And um, I've spent years working with people who were cosmically opening and it was incredibly beautiful, like really psychic people. And I really would have really liked to, to have known the older stuff. Like I didn't realize that Steiner had wrote like cosmic memory mm -hmm. and some of the other really interesting books. There was one, also, it was like about Mars. There's some really interesting Victorian old. Yes. You can probably give some more suggestions on particularly like the spheres or, but they're so modern. They're so incredibly modern and no yeah. one is talking about that stuff. Yeah. And um, if I would have had that, 
you know. I know. It's amazing. Like five, five, ten years years. That, that wasn't your foundation, oddly enough. No, my foundation was a lot of nights staring at my wall like this, like, what just happened? <laughs> that was I was just figuring everything out for myself, which which was my path. But well, no, your experience first. You know, I was ex yeah. yeah, I was uh -huh. I was experienced first, and I and I still have to like, you know, even the experiences that I've had, like I, you know, you you, you look at them a different way. When she, the more you learn and the more you know, you're like, oh, I, I experienced that wrong. That was that. And so it takes a while to, it's a, it's a journey. It's basically a journey. And if you want to be really good at psychic development, be a child inside and love change, embrace change, embrace being challenged and be very, very eager to let go of what you believe today, tomorrow. And then wow. you'll be, you'll be really flowing. Fantastic. Uh, everyone, thank you so much. It's been great having hey, Gigi here. There are a couple questions. Oh, you have questions? Okay, right. <laughs> you so, never know. Okay. Yes. So a bunch of people wanted Gigi to answer a question about the Amazon rainforest burning oh. and whether that would affect the resonance of the earth. Yeah, that would. Yeah. Yeah, that would definitely affect. The trees are like antennas, which is why Bohemian Grove with the sequoia trees and the redwood trees, why they're doing all that weird stuff at night there is they're trying to, you know, to talk to the trees and, and the druids knew this. The druids knew what the trees were doing and that the trees were absorbing the stars and speaking the stars. Um, and so when you have, and, it, and it's not even just the trees, it's all the unknown species and, and amazing ecosystem that's there. So it definitely will have it have an effect on us spiritually and obviously globally and i hope we can you know uncover exactly how this happened and you know hopefully we can stop it it's really terrible no question oh, when graham hancock uh was here he you know this is something that he's experienced um through ayahuasca which is the actual sentient being of the amazon mm -hmm. and uh he was he was really on you know, it was a really mystical place he was coming from on it, but he felt the same way that this had absolutely has to stop. It's an activity that collectively humanity has to reject straight up. What else you got, Ms. Olivia? Okay, there was one other great question about, <laughs> I guess Kim Kardashian and Kanye West <sighs> had a baby and named him, what was it, Northeast West. Did you know this? Oh, no. No, and they wanted to know about the occult significance of that name. Mm. Well, Gigi, this is a great one for you. Directions are certainly powerful. Yes, but leaving out south, I think that's interesting too. So it's just northeast. I'll west. tell you an interesting thing that occurs to me, and then I'll let Gigi answer the question for real, mm -hmm. is that Casey, when he did readings, he would do the readings, if they were physical readings, he'd do it with his head to the south when he would go into trance. If they were spiritual readings or life readings, his head would be to the north. Uh, so there is something about directions there, Gigi. There is. I mean, it's how the magnetism works. It's how energy flows. You can call certain things to you. It's like you were saying about about Lily, um, how they they you know they 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 covered them up, but he had you know sigils on certain walls of your house, oh. and that's that's part of ceremonial magic. Is to let me tell you, I am looking into his cottage stuff so much because they scrubbed that article completely off the internet. But in the 50s, they were doing that redevelopment and they found those sigils, they found hieroglyphs. And I mean, this is in the 1600s, this guy lived. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's like, it matters. And I wanna know what you find, cause I just find that I wanna do it to my house. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding guys. Um, but it's, uh, it's incredible because what wall did he put what sigil on? Yes. You know, and it, when you start using the directions like that, you're starting to get kind of ceremonial with things. Um, and so it's, I mean, the Kardashians are, they're on a, they're on a different path, I would say, than something that I would recognize. Um, you know, I, I think that whatever they're doing there is something that that's, they've got going on between them and I don't recognize it. Um, I do know that 
their other child is Psalm. So it, it's a bibl it's actually a biblical name. It's another weird name. Yeah. Yeah. So they are choosing occult names for their children, wh whether that's they're being told to name them that way. Um, because to get that famous, you've got to you've got to make some sacrifices. Mm. So, and usually your children, unfortunately, are part of that. Like that's just be real. Um, and so, what's going on there with that? I mean, very well could be. There's a Christian name in there, though. Yeah, absolutely. And what's fascinating is, I mean, a lot of people would associate the Kardashians with junk culture and like the kind of like bring down the culture. A lot of people would look at them as the celebrities that they know or, you know, kind of the face of the time in a way. So it, it is, it's, it's a complex thing. I think when you get on that level, I think that those people waste opportunities that that would be my message for them, which is they're an incredible place where they can broadcast a message to so many people and they bring it down to this incredible common uh, denominator. Uh, so <laughs> it yeah. is very disappointing. Culturally, it's very disappointing, but the names are very interesting. Speaking of unusual things, before we leave off, and thank you, Olivia, it's mm -hmm. great. <laughs> even, your, <laughs> even your brief return was something to celebrate. Um, the uh, of course Olivia would catch the question in her sleep, you know, like I'd have to look really close. Like, nope, nobody asked anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess that's the end of the Q and A section. Uh, this is the uh, Craven Cottage, which is where um, Emma Britton identified they did the Orphic Circle meetings. In one of these meetings, Gigi, uh, she said that uh, the room everything was spinning in the room and there was like a, a wind thing and she woke up out of the trance because everything was so freaky and there were these beings standing uh, by this fireplace and that everybody was running out of the room because they were so freaked out and there was a woman yelling in her ear to go back into trance. Oh, no. <laughs> but uh, this is where it all happened and interestingly enough, I think if we take a look there, we see it's pretty surrounded with lots and lots of Egyptian imagery. Again, we're back to Egypt and the Egyptian mystery schools and the power, I guess, the symbolism has, even to this day. Unusual place, I guess, actually probably a pretty good place for the Orphic Circle to meet up. Yeah, it probably has incredible energy. <laughs> Um, I didn't want to leave tonight without showing a picture of Queen Victoria so we can all contemplate her unusual leanings, for better or for worse, into these esoteric subjects and the fact that she selected this remarkable Queen Alexandra uh, for her son who became this, you know, some 40 years Princess of Wales. Um, Something very deep going on there with Victoria and her interest in these things, regardless of anything else. But certainly the royals, uh, they they have that connection when we get around these occult topics. There's no doubt about it. Um, I think that's pretty much it tonight. It's great to see everyone out there. We're going to see you next Friday at 8 p.m. And we're coming in with X series episode 64. And I'll give you a hint. Uh, we're going deep into the hot zone. So you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, and we have some good stuff we've been building up there. Tonight uh, belonged to Gigi Young and a remarkable uh, overview on so many different topics uh, tonight. Thank you so much, Gigi. Of course, people can go to ggyoung.com and um, they can find your courses there. And if they want more information, uh, they can actually take the courses is the best way to kind of get on board with the work you're doing. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm at ggyoung.com and I have a premium section where we get to have live Q&As just like this. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> I've talked to some of the students who do your stuff and they're blown away. So, uh, and they make progress so quickly, I think. Um, so it's, it's the gift of the work that you're doing. It's fantastic to have you here. I often say it, but there's no greater uh, ally or friend of the X series than GG Young. And she proves it every time uh, she comes on. So it's great to see you. Thank you for having me. And we will see everyone uh, next week. I guess, Olivia, the only question left <laughs> is what's for dinner? 
It's going to be onion rings. <laughs> oh, now you're talking. Uh, not even indulgent. Um, we will see everyone next week, and uh, we will have Miss Olivia back. I will be uh, back in full form. <laughs> now we're talking. I guarantee you. Um, and uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, we have some great shows coming up for September. What you want to do is become a member so you have access uh, to some of the incredible uh, material that we're going to be putting out in relation to the hot zone uh, and subscribers. We'll get that first. Go to darkjournalist.com and become a member. Um, we've made it incredibly affordable, and this is the time uh, to do it and get behind the show uh, so we can get the really, really good shows out to you. And uh, it's terrific being with you tonight. Of course, Exe and the mystery around the Orphic Circle and Alice in Wonderland is something that we've dived into here. And that work is just going to open up more and more. So it's great to see so many of you out here tonight. Uh, we have a cult fan. He's out there. Uh, we know for sure Thomas Tyson, always good with the jokes. Starlight um, and everyone else. We will see you next week. Thanks so much. And thank you, Olivia. Bravo. This, it was fun watching the show for a change. <laughs> it was great. Nicely done. Talk to you soon. We'll see you soon, everyone. And have a great night and have a great weekend. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Jay Mallet. It's good to see you. Gaia Sophia, excellent. Terrific to see you as well. Najat, of course. I hope you're doing great. I hope your summer's going great. Rincey, fantastic. Brenda Fisher, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next week.